Enter Caiaphas, the high priest, the atheist. Caiaphas was the high priest. He was the chief justice of the supreme court of the nation of Israel. But he was an atheist, and I will prove it. He may have been a closet atheist, but he was an atheist nonetheless, because he thought there'd be no consequence to what he knew he was doing and what he knew was wrong. The trial of Jesus was a crime in itself. And there is a rooster crowing. Caiaphas did not believe in God's unseen hand. He didn't think there was a foot up there that would stomp on him. He thought it was okay to bend the law a little bit, break the law a little bit because of the exigent circumstances. We've got a problem here. We've got to do something. We have to do it now. And if we have to break the law a little bit to get there, well, who's to know? Because after all, we're the Sanhedrin and we're the high priests of the law. We know the law. They don't know the law. They'll never figure it out. We'll get away with it. No unseen hand in his mind, though he was the high priest. He didn't understand jurisprudence. He didn't care at all about that. What's right? That didn't come first. Interesting that the jurist part of that word does come first, then the prudence part. Caiaphas ignored the very law that he claimed gave him the authority to even be the high priest. I mean, he couldn't be the high priest without authority. And Caiaphas claimed to have an authority, and apparently he did have an authority. He was the chief of the Supreme Court of the nation of Israel. By virtue of the law. Now look what he did. The law said no conviction for a capital offense on the testimony of less than two witnesses. And both had to agree. And if you remember your Bibles, you know that we had, I think it's in Mark and it's also in John where it's spoken of, that they didn't agree. One said this, the other said that. According to the law, no conviction. But a conviction came nonetheless because exigence raised its ugly head and a rooster crowed and no one heard. No arrest at night. No arrest through efforts of a conspirator, Judas Iscariot. No arrest without a legal mandate, without a warrant, properly issued. No arrest. And yet, the Roman soldiers who went to take him in the Garden of Gethsemane had no warrant. They bound him and took him to Caiaphas. No trial at night. That was the law. No trial at night, period. No trial in secret. If you're going to have a trial, it's got to be out in the open. But back then, the law was, if it's not in the open, it's not valid. If it's not valid, no conviction. That's, that's how the law is supposed to work. That's how the lex is supposed to obey the just. But it doesn't because none of us were taught much about this except the few of us that got to go to a really good law school. The accused had the right to assistance of counsel. Instead, he got nothing. If you couldn't afford a lawyer, an advocate, a paraclete, which is what that word meant, if you couldn't afford one, they had to appoint one for you. Somebody had to represent your cause, even if they didn't agree with you. 
That was the law. That Caiaphas said authorized him to be the high priest. The law that Caiaphas said gave him authority to condemn Jesus. And yet it was broken. What, what was he standing on then? And what are we standing on today? There's more. The accused could not be required to testify against himself. I adjure you by the living God, if you be the Son of God. Is that what he said? Is that what your Bible says? Those of you who've read your Bible? I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And then again, he asked again, are you the Son of God? And yet the law said, the law that justified Caiaphas to do anything, that he could not be required to testify against himself, and further, that even if he did, which would be a confession, that it was not competent for a conviction. The burden of proof was on the Sanhedrin. Confession was not even admissible. But that's what happened. It all happened at night. Because there was an exigent circumstance in the mind of Caiaphas, we've got to get rid of this fellow. No circumstantial evidence allowed, no guesswork, no hunches. That was the law. Over 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, under the rule of the Sanhedrin. No hearsay evidence. No member of the court could act as accuser or prosecutor. Well, many of you have seen this Killing Jesus film or the new AD film or some of the many other films of the road, way back at the road. <laughs> Most of you are maybe old enough to remember that one. And, and we've, we've seen this story over and over and over again. And Caiaphas was the prosecutor, contrary to the law of Moses. No evidence except when the accused was present. No oath by witnesses. If you lied in court, that was deterred by the rule that if you lied in a capital case, then you were likely to suffer the same punishment. If the accused in a capital case was convicted, the witness was required to attend the execution. A majority, I'm almost done, please forgive me, a majority was sufficient to convict or acquit. Majority rule. Convict or acquit, majority rule. But if a majority voted to acquit, trial was over. If a majority voted to convict, which is what happened, then a different procedure had to be followed, and it wasn't. No announcement of verdict that day. The court had to adjourn for a full day, and all the judges were supposed to go home, don't deal with business, don't deal with anything, just think about what you heard at the trial, weigh the evidence in your mind, consider the law, but of course, Caiaphas had talked them into ignoring. And then come back, and there was a second ballot. Interesting, in the second ballot, if you voted to acquit, you couldn't change your vote. But if you voted to convict, you could. Do you see how it all favored this presumption of innocence? And a unanimous verdict of guilty required an acquittal. It was presumed that if they all unanimously voted for conviction, that the accused did not get his representative. He did not get his advocate. There was no one on his side, and therefore, back when all these laws were being created, before Caiaphas was ever born, someone wise contemplated that then it's probably a conspiracy. 
So it results in an acquittal. And Jesus would have gone free. Now I know it's not God's will that Jesus went free. That's not the point. He said, I take up my life, I lay it down, I take it up again. It was all his choice. But in this, there's a lesson for us today that I think maybe we are missing as a society. Because we are allowing Lex to usurp just. We're letting Lex move to deal with exigent circumstances that maybe need more foresight, more prudence, more consideration of what's right rather than what's exigent. Because that's all Caiaphas thought about. I mean, they plotted all this way before the trial. And it's in your Bible. From that day, they purposed to kill him. Caiaphas didn't care about justice. God does. Caiaphas did not understand nor care what jurisprudence is, nor the consequence of ignoring what that sacred word stands for. Nor do many in high and low places today. And I hear a rooster crowing. Before noon that same day, Jesus was crucified in violation of the laws of Israel and Rome. Nailed to a rugged old cross, closing the darkest chapter in the history of judicial administration. And sounding the greatest call the world will ever hear for humans, that's us, to work together, not just individually, for a more enlightened system of justice. The law of Moses was prostituted to destroy the most innocent man who ever lived, just as laws are prostituted today to serve the self-interest of a powerful few who care nothing for jurisprudence or the unseen hand of God.